Welcome to Scoriography, a podcast about the greatest sport on ice, figure skating. I'm Wendy Buskey. And I'm Adrian Buskey, and this is our Q&A episode. Basically, we're in one of the in-between weeks between the big events as we close in towards the end of the season with only a couple of large competitions left, like Challenge Cup and the World Championships. In the last couple of episodes, we have asked you, the listeners, to provide us questions that we could kind of tackle in this episode. You guys really showed up for this. You gave us a lot of great questions. There was a lot to parse through. And we tried to put as many of them as we could into this episode. A few times we've had to kind of group a couple of them together because they've been thematically related in a way that it just made sense to merge them into a single question. But we're so grateful for you guys just really turning up in both of the comments on YouTube and also through the email form to just send us a lot of these questions. Yeah, it was really thrilling to hear from so many of you. I think there's a few specific ones I'm going to sound giddy about as we go because they really hit on things that I love. So I'm excited to dig in. Our first question is a two-parter from Soho Songs who commented via YouTube. They're directed at each of us in turn, and you'll understand why here in a second. So their first question is, Wendy, how did you coerce or convince Adrian to start watching figure skating in the first place? And so contextually, what they're referencing is Wendy is a lifelong figure skating fan, has been deeply into the fandom of it since she was a child. I am a convert that she brought on board in the early 2000s after we got together. And so that's the context for this question. It's so much fun. So I think the most specific thing that I can reference is Whenever Adrian and I got together, he was stuck with me talking about it a lot and being a little bit lost. You had some frame of reference, like you knew who Nancy Kerrigan and Scott Hamilton and people at that level of celebrity in the skating culture and wider pop culture you were aware of. But specifically getting him into it happened whenever I pulled out my giant tub of VHS tapes from skating programs that I had recorded as a child and teenager that I had held on to into my 20s. So I think a lot of married couples and also just people who leave their parents' house and move into their first apartment or first house have that experience where the parents are like, oh, cool, you have your own place. Now take all yes. this crap that you've had shoved <laughs> into a closet at our house all this time. And over time, you just get piles of stuff. And that was one of the things that happened with you is that basically... Your mom was like, okay, cool. Here are these enormous boxes full of VHS. Please take yes. these to your house. Yeah, my mom was kind enough to give me back all of my VHS tapes. And whenever I got them home, I was geeking out about things that I had recorded in the early to mid 90s and telling Adrian about all of these people like Kurt Browning and Paul Wiley and Brian Boitano and Christy Amaguchi. And he was just like, yeah, I've heard of most of those people. I'm not really that into it, but, you know, I've heard of it. But now I suddenly had the material to show him like, well, I am going to show you why you should know who these people are. And I went through a lot of programs <laughs> that were my favorite programs. And most of them you were just like, cool, I'm just I'm going to be really patient with my wife and, you know, make her happy. But then I got to Paul Wiley. And I showed you, I think it was his Schindler's List program yeah. that captured your interest. And I caught that and you were pretty expressive about like, well, I like this guy. So then I went through and just found everything Paul Wiley I could show you. So, yeah, I always think of it as I at least lured you in with Paul Wiley. That was the first step. But that actually kind of leads well into our second question from Soho Songs, which was for Adrian. Was there a specific skater team or program that got you hooked? So like you said there, definitely the Paul Wiley programs were the first things that you showed to me that were really compelling. And afterwards, I started watching skating with you, like real-time competitive skating in its moment. I think I had a little bit previous to this, but I don't think it was really keyed into it in a big way. And I do remember very specifically liking skaters like Kimmy Meisner and Alyssa Sisney a whole lot. And really not liking skaters like Sasha Cohen a whole lot. But it really hadn't just clicked. It hadn't made me a fan. I was just somebody who was watching it with you kind of casually. The change for me came when uh, we went to see the U.S. Nationals 2006 men's free skate. Which I want to point out, you thought you were going to something with 
all disciplines because that's something that was an expectation you had not knowing what you were getting yourself into. And I'm like, no, this is four hours of just men. Right. And I did not know that. I didn't understand at that point the way the programs kind of broke up because I really all I had ever seen was just whatever NBC put on. So you said, oh, we're going to nationals. And I was like, because it was here in St. Louis and it was relatively affordable to go to it. And it was like during the day at some point. So I think we had to take off work for it. And in that particular moment in time, the only discipline that I found interesting, really, that I remember finding interesting was the women's division because of some of the skaters I just mentioned. I didn't realize until we got there that we were just going to see the men's long and it was going to be four hours of the men's competition. What really surprised me about it was just how exciting and impressive it was to see it live. And in particular, that event included Evan Lysacek, future Olympic gold medalist, Johnny Weir, who won that year. A guy named Matt Slavoy, who kind of disappeared off the map after that, I think, the following season, but who was really good at that competition. And then Michael Weiss, I think, in his last competitive season before he went pro. And those four guys really stand out to me as being super strong competitors at the event. And I walked away from that with a completely different vision of figure skating, understanding how impressive it was to see it in person, to see the athleticism, the artistry. And it really just absolutely opened up the whole world of it for me. No, and it was so much fun to get to see you have that realization, especially Matt Savoy was fairly significant because I remember you watching his program and being legitimately wowed and like, oh, I don't know what this guy brings to it, but I'm really into this. And that only excited you for the rest of the skaters. And that meant a lot to me as someone who had gone to only a few competitions in my childhood, but been obsessed with the sport for so long to have seen that little spark actually start to twinkle. I'm like, ooh, I got him. That's definitely the turning point for me, for sure. That's where my figure skating fandom became real. Now, the deeper fandom came quite a bit later, but that is where it really all started. Our next question is from Emily Rose from Boston, who sent several questions via email. Emily asked, what's your first memory of watching figure skating? And was it love at first sight? Now, obviously, you know, that wasn't love at first sight for me. But I do remember watching figure skating much earlier than that. But for you, Wendy, what was the first thing you remember? The first thing I remember is Brian Boitano. I can't remember the year specifically, but I know it was a world championship in the 80s. I was a kid. And my mom was really, really into the sport by that point. But it just had been something in the background that I had not paid attention to. Really watching and falling in love and feeling that sense of this is worth my time as a child that just wanted to go back and hang out with my friends and play with Barbies and, you know, all that good stuff was Brian Boitano for sure. It was just something special about what he did and just the way he jumped was just something I had never seen anyone do. It was magic. I wish I could remember more than just the vision of Brian Boitano gliding across my probably 20-inch screen and being like, ooh, that guy. For me, I do distinctly remember watching figure skating with my mom when I was a kid in grade school, middle school, even to a little bit in high school. We were not enormous sports people, but whenever the Olympics came on, you you dropped everything and you watched the Olympics. And so... You know, we definitely got absorbed into that stuff. I was much earlier a fan of gymnastics over figure skating when it comes to like the Olympic style sports like that. But I have a lot of memories of Saturday afternoons watching skating specials with my mom when they would show things like Stars on Ice or the Champions Tour, things like that. I don't know that I could have named anything other than Stars on Ice if you had not prompted me with that. (laughs) But I do remember Scott Hamilton very clearly. He's probably the first skater that I kind of remember. People like Kurt Browning and Brian Bertano and, you know, and a number of the, you know, obviously Tanya Harding and Nancy Kerrigan and all that was such a big deal in, you know, in the news. You kind of couldn't avoid it. But the thing for me in that time period was it was something I was doing just to be doing something with my mom. Uh, It wasn't really all that interesting to me. And very specifically, I remember the outfits being repulsive to me. (laughs) I just couldn't stand to look at the visual of the sport in that era. And you got to contextualize this with I was a rock and roll kid, especially once I got into like middle school and on where I was like really into like heavy metal and rock music and the aesthetics of that, which are in their own way, deeply ridiculous. And I was also a comic book kid. So I was growing up with like the X-Men and like, you know, superheroes and stuff that were like visually the things I was really into. 
And, you know, they're all spandex clad and colorful and whatever. And you think that would translate over into skating. But I just looked at all of the visual representation of it, the aesthetic of it, and I just couldn't get on board. So it took me a lot later until you introduced me to some of those really good programs of Wiley to make me go, oh, there's a lot more validity to this sport than just pretty skating on ice. It makes me wish that somewhere, somehow in your childhood, a skater named Joseph Sabovchuk would have made it into your view because he was essentially, he looked like a lot of the guys in heavy metal bands. He still does actually kind of, but he was this very tall, very metal looking dude who could do these wild jumps. And I just, I think maybe your childhood would have been different had you seen a little bit more Jumpin' Joe. I could have gotten on board with that, I think. Yeah. Emily Rose also asked the question, and this kind of relates to a lot of what we were just talking about. She asked, what's your favorite Paul Wiley program? Oh, my gosh. And for me, the easy answer is Schindler's List, because I think that's the first one you showed me. And it did have that big impact on me to see something that did feel so artistically complete and compelling. And I, I'll note here, too, that I, like, I actually studied a little bit of dance in college. So I have, a, I mean, just the smidgen of a modern dance background. You would not know it to meet me, <laughs> but there was a little bit of that. So when I saw the stuff that Paul Wiley did there, I could look at that and go, oh, this is athleticism and artistic expression. This is storytelling and storytelling is what really meant something to me. So that really landed for me. Emily Rose, you gave me my favorite question of this entire experience. So thank you. This was a hard question. Favorite Paul Wiley question is like asking who your favorite child is. <laughs> he is his own entity of wonder. One of my absolute all-time favorite skaters, but it's probably his Carmina Burana program that he did as a professional. I can't pick which version of it because he did it for years, but it always just blew me away and just was the most connected I've seen a skater to a piece of music. It was just super intense and fun. But I do have three special mentions. JFK, I saw that. That was one of the, I think the first time I saw Paul Wiley skate in person. He did the JFK program. So it will always hold an extremely special spot in my heart. And it's just an incredible program. His Why God Why exhibition from the 1992 Winter Olympics. I'm, now I am getting specific. That program made me cry every time he did it. Not going to lie. It meant a lot. And then, of course, his Henry V Olympic long program from 1992 that won him a silver medal. And I think it should have won him a gold. And I will love him forever. Thank you very much. Bye. <laughs> yeah, Emily, you clearly hit her feelings on that one. Yeah. I don't know how to say this correctly, but it's uh, like Rorolet, Rorolet from YouTube asked in a similar vein, what is your favorite Gabby and Guillaume program? So Gabby Papadakis and Guillaume Cicerone, what is your favorite program from them? Easy peasy. Made to love. Their Olympic short program from 2022, affectionately referred to as the whacking program that I watch, I'd say at least once every couple of weeks, I watch that program. If it shows up in my social media feed, I watch it. I'm obsessed with it. I will always be obsessed with it. That's mine too. Gabby and Guillaume are obviously incredible across the board in all of their artistic and technical skills, but that one is so unique. I think you've seen the influence of it immediately how whacking elements have made it into a lot of other skaters choreography it felt very avant-garde in its moment and what i think is interesting is when you have a team like gabby and guillaume where they can do something that feels different and avant-garde and take something that was such a part of gay culture you know that came directly out of gay culture especially like in the i think in the 80s 70s and 80s something like that like you know dance that was very big in gay clubs and stuff and then brought it into the skating mainstream like that when you see other teams that are a little bit more technically avant-garde in their stuff, and I think a lot about Chalk and Bates here, where at times both the judges and the audience are slower to come on board with it, it was very interesting to see Gabby and Guillaume do something that was that out of the box and deliver it perfectly and get pretty much universal praise for it. So I think it's a beautiful program, and what I think is super great about it is how it introduced a whole new element of choreography into skating. Yes, and I want to also point out with that, that as both of them identify as queer and also respect the medium and the style of dance, whenever they committed to it, there's a great documentary you can watch on YouTube that shows where they're not only learning the choreography to a program, but learning a lot of the meaning behind the movement and really educating themselves on where whacking was inspired from. 
So just the level of detail and commitment to making sure that they were doing it well and doing it right and felt like something they should be doing. There was just a lot of history going into what they did on the ice. And I just respect the hell out of that program beyond just loving how it looks. So for our next question, this is going to be a little bit of a combo deal because two people asked questions that were relatively similar to each other, but I'm going to read them both. From YouTube, Nicole said, it would be interesting to hear about your all-time favorite skaters and moments in skating history. And then also on YouTube, Liam said, could you pick a favorite skater ever from each discipline and talk about why you love them the most? I think those two kind of come together. So Wendy, for you, favorite skaters, I mean, you've kind of touched on a little bit, obviously, Paul Wiley was mentioned a lot in there, but some of your favorite skaters from each discipline and then a few of your just favorite moments. All right. Well, I took this very literally in the who is your favorite skater in each discipline. So I narrowed it to just a single one with a few special mentions. It's very obvious that Paul Wiley is one of my top two favorite skaters of all time. But I'm going to actually just say that Kurt Browning is my favorite skater ever. He is the reason that I went from a skating fan to a skating fanatic. There was a distinct line that happened whenever I started watching him skate, particularly in the 91 to 95, 6 era. That time period, not only was the way he skated just so interesting to me because I felt like he blended together kind of the humor of a Scott Hamilton with the intensity of a Boitano with new technical pieces that felt like they were all his own, just had a sense of humor, a sense of self and choreography, just his ever-increasing level of difficulty in his footwork, which was always so spectacular. I just can't say enough. Plus, if I'm being completely candid, I also had a massive crush on him. <laughs> so all of that to say, Kurt Browning, uh, forever and always. On the women's side, I went with not a super well-known skater um, in her amateur days, but from the 80s and 90s, Karen Kadavy. She was the first woman of skating that I ever loved. Like, I just thought she was beautiful and perfect. And I wanted to be her best friend when I was a kid. I thought she was just the loveliest. With a close second of Christy Yamaguchi because I was a big 90s fangirl and Christy was everything. In dance, my favorite, I'm going to say Shaylin Bourne and Victor Kratz. Big skaters in the 90s into early 2000s. Shaylin Bourne is obviously, if you pay attention to choreography at all, she's everyone's choreographer at this point because she's a genius. But they, I think, changed my view of ice dance. I went from someone who liked ice dance to someone who was obsessed with them and then grew an appreciation for the discipline. And then my favorite pair of all time was really actually pretty tough for me. But I decided to go with uh, Natalia Mishkatonik and Artur Dmitriev again, from the 90s, incredible Russian pair that just had so much power and interesting spins. And they're just incredible to watch all the time. And for me, favorite moment actually was when, God, I'm a broken record. I am obviously of a certain age because most of my favorite things from skating are from the 90s. So I'm going to stick with the theme and say it's when they allowed professionals in quotes because skating used to be so defined by you are an amateur figure skater you can go to the olympics but once you start really making money and skating professionally you no longer are eligible for amateur competition and when that rule changed in 1993 going into the 94 lillehammer norway olympics my kid brain melted into a puddle because brian boitano the aforementioned legend was going to get to go to the Olympics again. So that moment at Skate America 1993 when Brian Boitano skated onto competitive ice again, I cried. I was just like, this is the best thing ever. So, oh, that's my favorite moment, but it's not skating history, but it was skating history for me when I met very, very briefly Kurt Browning at Ice Wars 1994 and I have proof because it's on YouTube now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, where I watched Kurt Browning do his short program at Ice Wars. And I had brought a stuffy and I ran down to the boards and he saw me standing there and skated over and gave me a hug and kissed my cheek and took my, I think, stuffed monkey that I had brought for him and skated off. And my teenage heart just exploded. 
I loved when she first told me that story back in the day <laughs> and YouTube had just kind of appeared. You know, it was fairly new. And I was like, oh, let's take a shot. And I looked it up and I found it. I know. Uh, I don't know if it's still there. We haven't I don't know. I haven't time. watched it a long time. But, uh, yeah. but yeah, that was actually out there in the world, which was hilarious. I think a running theme that you're going to see here before I go into my answers is that along with just the division of time that we have as far as my skating starting in the mid 2000s and yours going back much earlier, it is also you are this font of skating knowledge and experience within the fandom for it. And your memory goes much further back into all of it. I'm a very like now focused guy. I have nostalgia things that I love, but in general, I tend to be very focused in the modern era. And so even things that I loved 10 years ago just slipped from my mind. I'm also super ADHD. I don't know if I've ever talked about on, <laughs> uh, that on here before, but those older things kind of go away for me. So there's a lot of the stuff I'm going to talk about. It's going to be very present day because it's the things that are right in my mind. But the one place I'll break from that a little bit is when I talk about my favorite women skaters. That's a tough question. All these are tough questions. Um, I'm not good at picking favorites. No. I'm not one of those people that just centers in on a singular fandom or person. I'm not like that. But the first skater that I think I really was a fan of was Ashley Wagner. I loved Ashley skating. I loved her general attitude, her vibe. I liked that she was kind of mouthy. I liked that she had no poker face. So both on and off the ice, I really enjoyed her as a persona and a skater. And so she was the first person that I think that when I was watching events that I would get upset when she didn't get the scores I thought she deserved or that I would get really hyped for when she would succeed. I feel like there's a lot of her skating that shows up in the women's discipline now that I think that in the time period that she wasn't necessarily what everybody was looking for or thought skating should be. And let me tell you, I have some feelings about that whole purity of skating thing. I'm not <laughs> going to get into it here, but I definitely have issues with it, particularly as a person who came in late into the fandom. But it's difficult for me to say my favorite women skater of all time because I haven't really watched any of her programs in a long time. But I do just remember being really into them in the current era. It would probably be Kari Sakamoto because I love her skating style. I love what she brings to the ice. I could not decide on a favorite men's skater. I don't know. I don't know how to answer this question. I'm so amazed by this. And it really does show the fact that you hate picking a favorite. Yeah. Because you have many favorites. I just love so many people. And it's a weird thing for me when I like go and look at skating Twitter, which is just so Delulu a lot of the time. <laughs> I mean, in a fun way sometimes, but in an obsessive way in others. I just am not one of those people who can just pick one thing and really become obsessive about it. I'm not built that way. And when it comes to the men, there's so many that I really enjoy, but I just couldn't find a single one to say, that's, that's the one, that's the, the person whose skating style defines what I like in a men's skater. I just don't have it. So I can't answer that. Much easier for me in ice dance because my favorites are chalk and baits. I love their skating style. I love the presence they bring to the ice. I have been very open about my feelings about Madison Chalk, you know, on, on this show. But in general, the different quality that they bring to the skate, how distinct they are from the styles of most of the other teams they compete against, everything about that, their music choices, their costumes, all of it, it just works for me in a big way. I'm going to throw an honorary mention, though, to I think the first ice dance team I really liked, and that was the Ship Zips. The Shibitani siblings were one of the first other ice dance teams in an era where I thought ice dance was pretty boring whenever I first kind of came into the fandom. I just didn't get it overall but I really like the Shibitanis. So shout out to them. In pairs, it's Riku Mira and Ryuchi Kihara from Japan. I don't have a depth of fandom in pairs. It's definitely a discipline that has been pretty secondary for me as a person watching the sport over the years. But they're the one team that blends both that incredible physicality with deep emotional energy. Their programs make me feel something more than just impressed. And that's why I'm always drawn to it. And then just a few fave moments. The first time I think I remember being just jump out of my seat hype was Evan Lysacek winning gold at the Olympics in Vancouver. That one really stands out in my memory as one where I was like, I was lit, just so excited at the end of that skate. The footwork sequence of that one stands out in my mind as one of those things that I watched and I was just like really deeply into. Tessa and Scott winning gold at their Olympics in 2018 with the Moulin Rouge program. I'll talk more about that one later. And just to throw something from now, because I've watched it over and over again, 
It's Allison Reed and Sully Zumberly because his uh, bronze win in Lithuania. It just stands out to me as one of those incredible emotional moments with a perfect skate and a perfect crowd. That one just really sticks out to me. So another question from Emily Rose, because she had a lot of really good questions. You get to hand select the cast of a new figure skating tour. Who's your dream cast? And you created some guidelines for this because I started creating a tour that had about 50 skaters on it. Yeah, I thought about us seeing Stars on Ice last year and thinking about how they structured it. And so I was like, here's the rules. Three single women skaters, three single men skaters, two pairs teams, two dance teams. Initially, I was going to say only people who are currently skating, whether pro or amateur, but that fell apart for us. So now she was just, vetoed. Yes. Um, so now <laughs> it would just be anybody from any time period to create the greatest tour. What are your choices there? Okay, so this was hard, but I have my reasons. For the women, I picked Yuna Kim, Christy Yamaguchi, and Kaori Sakamoto. So from three different eras, three of my favorite skaters just absolutely adore them. For the men, I picked Paul Wiley, Yuzuru Hanyu, and Shoma Uno. Again, kept it kind of broad, wanted a little bit of 90s, 2000s, want a little bit of the goat from Yuzu, and then I want my current Shoma Uno obsession. For the dance, I'm uh, a basic bitch and went with Papadakis and Cicerone and Virtue and Moir because why wouldn't I? <laughs> and for the pairs, I went again with uh, Natalia Mishkatonik and Artur Dmitriev and my teenage favorites that one of them is now fairly problematic, so I feel a little weird about it, but Isabel Brissor and Lloyd Eisler. Their nicknames were Fred and Herbie, and I was a big Fred and Herbie fan. So for old time's sake, I left them on the list. But I really wish I could have also added Deanna and Max from current times if I had three, because I really want to see them live. <laughs> For my team, you know, I created this thinking, OK, what would I want right now, knowing that it could change in a week? So for my three women's choices, I chose Kari Sakamoto, Satoko Miyahara, because we have seen her live and she is phenomenal live. And I would go see her anytime. And then Ashley Wagner. For the men, I chose Yuzu. So Yuzu Hanyu. Adam Shaun Fa and Jun Wan Cha. Interesting. Yeah. For the pairs, I chose Riku and Ryuchi, as mentioned earlier, and then Sway and Han uh, oh, from yes. China because they are spectacular. We went back and watched some of their programs recently, just incredible. And then for dance, Virtual and Moyer for all those same reasons. And then, of course, Chalk and Bates. I like these. But yes, I also kept thinking to myself last night after we started talking about all of this, why wasn't Daisuke on my list? Because now I'm ashamed that Daisuke is not on my list. All of these names just kept flooding through. His just comes to mind immediately. I almost swapped Chalk and Bates for Takahashi and Muramoto. I should say Muramoto and Takahashi, Kana and Daisuke, because I have not seen them live. And we have seen Chalk and Bates live. So that was real close. It could change any given time. I would love it because I do absolutely adore Kana and Daisuke. And I'm so sad that they're retired now, but they were phenomenal. But Emily, you gave us a really hard one on that. Yes, that was difficult. There, there was legitimately living room debate about that question last yes. night. Let's dig into some questions about the rules and some general ISU stuff. So I feel like a lot of these questions have kind of a thematic to them. So FX from YouTube asked some of these questions. There was also a similar question from Emily in Boston. But they asked, what changes to the judging system do you feel could help improve the sport? And what current rules do you think negatively impact skating? This was hard. There were a lot of thoughts I had about this. I think we can do a whole episode at some point about ways we'd love to see the judging system change. So I won't go too far and too deep. But rules that I think are currently impacting the sport in not a great way are things like costume violations. Most of them are outdated. Yeah. And especially whenever you're trying to bring skating out into the masses more, things like that aren't going to win you any new fans. Absolutely they, not. They lose you current fans. And I think that it's way past time to get rid of most of that. I'd say another thing that is going to lose you fans and not gain any new friends is giving too high of PCS scores to skaters who have flawed programs. We've talked about that type of thing many times throughout this season where we've seen it. And the other one I can think of just in terms of recent within the last two years rules that has kind of felt weird is the amount of points delivered for the quad axle. For something that seems like it was a never going to happen, no one can do this piece of athleticism, 
to not give it a little bit more almost seems like you're not encouraging people to try new things. And I know that that is something that we've seen in gymnastics as well with like Simone Biles creating new things in the women's discipline and getting seriously underscored because no one else can do them and they think that they're too dangerous. You basically discourage athletes from pushing themselves to be what they could be. And yes, you have to be conscious of things that are dangerous and not encouraging those behaviors. That is not what I'm saying. It's just, I almost feel like you discourage innovation. Yeah. You know, there's an argument could be said that like right now that would give Ilya just such an outsized advantage. At True. Point. But he's also doing something that literally nobody else can do. And that's impressive. So and I then, think you can balance that out by maybe saying you can only do a triple axle, no quad axles in the short program. Not saying these should or shouldn't do that, but it's a possibility. Yeah, much in the way that the women's program doesn't allow for quads. For yeah. quads, yeah. So mine are, one is just make everything in the judging as transparent as possible. I think far too much of it is murky and obfuscated. And it is just frustrating as a fan at home to have deductions that nobody can make sense of. Even the commentators are like, I don't know why that just happened. And also just find a way to compensate for the discrepancies between like strict judges and forgiving judges. There's too often this big swing in the scoring from event to event because some of them go hard on every single thing that could possibly be nitpicked and others are just a little forgiving about stuff. I also hate the whole, well, that person's known for under rotation, so they look harder at her jumps, but they don't look at the other people when they're under rotating. They need to be judged consistently, and obviously the judges do not have that level of consistency so much of the time, and it's frustrating. I would also eliminate or lessen the deduction for time violation. I get really frustrated with this one because, yeah, it looks a little sloppy when a person finishes their program too early or too late, and there should be a loss in their component scores for that. But getting a full one-point deduction, which is sometimes devastating to the placement of the skater who might have otherwise skated well, is super frustrating, and also it seems to be applied inconsistently. We've definitely seen people totally get what should have been a time violation and then not, so again, with consistency and transparency. And also, I would just like to see greater oversight for who the judges are and what conflicts of interest that they might have when they go in. Oh my gosh, this Uh, one. When you've got people who are on the judging panel and then are the spouse of somebody from one of a major federation or a group that definitely has an agenda going into things, and sometimes it's blaringly obvious, those people should not be judging those events. I understand that the pool of judges to be pulled from is not necessarily the biggest resource in the world. And in a lot of regional events and stuff, they're volunteers. But there's just a lot about the way the judging works and the way it's involved in the culture. Just listening to, I finished listening to Gracie Gold's book, and she talks a lot about the kind of toxic relationship that judges can have with the skaters because they rub elbows with them in the banquet line and judge them on their clothing or they're watching what they're getting for their dinners and stuff. And all of that is super messy. So I just think that there's a lot of that that just needs to be tightened up. It needs more oversight. It needs to be more transparent and it needs to be fairer. I agree with all of that. And Sophia from YouTube asks, how do you guys feel about the age change for senior competition? I think that it was a positive move overall. I do feel bad for anyone that had been basing their career around getting to, say, the Milano Cortina Olympics and then the rule changed and they realized that the next Olympics they'd be eligible for was 2030. So anyone in that middle zone age range that's going to be directly impacted by it and not grandfathered in, I feel bad for them. That said, that's a small group. And overall, in the long term, I think it's going to make for a safer sport. I do think that it's a good thing. Yeah, I think that one, having elite competition that could mix people as young or 13 or 14 with adults I think is a problem. I really think that changing that so that it's like 17 and up is a very positive choice, like you said, for safety and for lots of other reasons. Also, I think that it then kind of creates an elite level sport where people can be adults and have careers that run longer without the expectation of you burn out at like 15 or 17, like we see happen so often, particularly in the women's discipline. I do think there should be sort of a sliding scale adjustment for Olympic qualification for skaters who are very close to but just cut off from Olympic qualification. In particular here, I look at like Mao Shimada 
from Japan who is one of the best women skaters in the world, but is in juniors and is because of her birthday is just cut off from that next Olympics. And it doesn't feel quite right, but fudging the details for individual skaters would be super problematic. And I don't have a good solution for that. But otherwise, yeah, I do think it's positive. Emily also asked, what are your thoughts on the 6.0 judging system versus the IJS? So the IJS has problems. No one is here to deny that ever. It is a flawed system. However, I will absolutely take it over the 6.0 system. At least the way that the 6.0 system was manipulated repeatedly for years, the overall complexity of IJS allows for tons of misuse and unfair scoring, for sure. But I think the 6.0 system is just something we're better off without. The AJS system can continue to grow and be adapted, but it is complex math versus junk math. 6.0 system is one of those things that when I watched skating when I was a teenager, I looked at that scoring system and I thought it was the stupidest thing I had ever seen. I just could not fathom how any of that worked, why you would use a six-point system, why it wouldn't be a 10-point system like gymnastics, why would it allow for so much manipulation in it? I think 6.0 was absolute garbage. Be gone. How do you really feel? (laughs) Yeah, be gone to the dumpster of history (laughs) And let's just continue to work to try to make the existing system better and fairer. It needs to evolve over time for sure. There's never going to be a perfect system in a sport that is as subjective as skating is. But I think it's a hell of a lot better than 6.0. Well, then, I guess that we had talked about the fact that we didn't really have hot takes. And I think that's your hottest take. I don't don't know why that would be particularly hot. To me, it feels so obvious, but I know some people (laughs) disagree. I've seen people talk about it in comment threads where they're like, it just recognized perfect and perfect is perfect. I'm like, there's no such thing as perfect. What are you even talking about? (laughs) Anyway, um, so House of Owls or House of Owls Art by YouTube. and Which is a great name. Yeah, yeah. They said, I've been wondering about mixed order of performances after the short program. Lately, I'm seeing it get mixed up. Uh, Was it always like that or is it specific to some competitions? And so what they're talking about there is when you go from the short program into the free skate and then the order of the free skate is often what we see the reverse order of the scores in the short program. So if you were in the last place in the short, you're the first person to skate in the long. And then if you were first in the short, you're the last person to skate in the free skate. What we've seen at several competitions this season is it being randomized amongst groups. Actually, we had another of our listeners who goes by, it looks like More Towers, answer this question for us. And I actually didn't quite realize But not Kristen More Towers, just to be specific. Not spelled the same way. So I don't (laughs) think it's Kristen More Towers. If you're listening, Kristen, hi, but probably not. But More Towers said the reverse order from the short program was the result of the pandemic to avoid bringing the skaters together for the draw. So we don't typically see the draw, but it is something that I've seen footage of before where literally you get a whole bunch of people in a room together and then they go up and pull something out of a hat and uh, and (laughs) they get a number. (laughs) In particular, I've seen some of the Japanese events for that at their nationals event because you can see when they go into the short program, you could just end up anywhere. Like, And I've seen great skaters walk up and pull one and just hang their head because... There's almost no way for the first skater in the short program to end up in that final group. It just almost never happens. And it's like the kiss of death for your nationals to have that take place. And it's brutal to see that. And I have mixed feelings about the draw in that way. But yeah, I didn't know that was a thing, really. Yeah. And again, as someone who's been watching the sport for many years, the switch from the draw to the ordered groups was confusing to me. So whenever we started going back to the randomized, it could be anybody in the top six that skates first or last in that group. That's more normal to me. So I don't really think it makes a difference for me as a viewer, but as skaters, I know it makes a big difference because very few skaters seem to ever want to skate last. So I think the randomized is preferred because then they may not have to. What more towers had said here was that in the final group, they actually do two separate draws. So the people who are sixth, fifth and fourth after the short program, they draw for those first three spots in the final group. And then the people who were third, second and first in the short program do a draw for the final three in the final warm up group. 
And that's why you could end up with, like we saw at Four Continents, where like Jun Wan Cha, who had been in like the third place position, was the last person to skate. I agree with House of Owls that there's something less exciting about that. There's a sense of, oh, the third place person who maybe doesn't have a chance at the top of the podium goes last. You could say that it could make an opportunity for underdog upsets in the last moment to jump forward. But it, there is a sense of anti-climax for the viewer at home, I think, when the person who's in the spot for gold maybe skates first, gets an enormous score, and then the next two just chase after them. There's something really great about watching that first place person see the first place come up at the end of it. But it also creates moments like we saw at U.S. Nationals where you have like an Isabel Levito go into it in that top spot and then fall to third, which creates a very dramatic ending as well. So House of Owls, I'm with you. I kind of don't like that mix up, but I also understand why a lot of the skiers don't want to go last and the pressure that that could put on them. And Sophie asked us if you could add categories of your own on the ISU Skating Awards that we just talked about last episode, what would you add? You and I had talked about this a little bit before, and I think I am in agreement, and this is not to steal your answer, it's more to have the conversation, I'd add divisions into the mix. So instead of just having best performance or most exciting performance, I would have best performance by someone in the men's competition and the dance competition, just because I'd like to see more apples to apples, even though each one of these is so distinct anyway, and I'm not sure how I feel about the IS words to begin with, but I'd like to see it split up into divisions. Yeah, I would definitely just make, instead of having most exciting program, I would do best programs, one for each discipline. I would put the awards at the world championships, like at the gala or the banquet or something, so you could have everybody there and hand them out post the whole season. I would eliminate the MVP award. I don't think it makes sense, at least in the way it's described. I think it's changed kind of every year and being like, well, you've got the most Instagram followers, so you get to have an award is dumb. But I think what would be a good replacement for it would be the best ambassador for the sport. So you could look and see who is the person who is actively bringing skating out further. And that could be like a person like Jason Brown, who has a, a great of. outreach, or it could be organizations like Diversify Ice that are actively working to expand the sport and bring it into marginalized and minority communities that have traditionally been underrepresented in it. I think either of those types of awards would really make sense for it. So that's where I would change. The I sport. like yours much better than mine. Very much so. <laughs> okay. So now we're going to kind of move into a section that it's more like predictions and sort of evaluations of certain things in the sport right now. And we'll start with Denise, who is from the U.S., who messaged us via email. And she asked a few questions about sort of the future prospects of USA skaters. Uh, the first of which is, what are the chances that Ilya Malinin gets beat at Worlds considering his U.S. free skate issues? I don't really think his U.S. free skate issues are going to make much of a difference going into Worlds personally. I think that he still stands a very good chance of skating extremely well at Worlds. However, I think the momentum is with Yuma right now after watching him at Four Continents. So if there's anything I'm concerned about with Ilya, it's more that after watching Yuma skate as well as he did at Four Continents and score as highly as he did, Ilya knows he's going to have to bring out everything. All of his tricks are going to have to be laid out at Worlds. So he's going to have the most risk in his programs. So yeah, that's more where my concern is, not as much to U.S. Nationals. Yeah, I think Yuma Kagiyama bringing in more and more of his quads and increasing the technical, which he knows he's going to need in order to be competitive with Ilya. I think that's the showdown there. I think even in recent interviews, Shoma has kind of almost discounted himself from that. He basically has just said like, no, it's impossible. Like, I can't take that these two on. makes me so sad. So. My heart belongs to you, Shoma. <laughs> Denise also asked, what chance do you think Isabel Levito has to win a world's medal? I hate saying this out loud, but my hopes aren't very high. I want to be wrong. So please, universe, let me be wrong. Really from Isabeau, I'm just hoping to see clean-ish skates that look comfortable, that where she starts looking like herself again. If she skates to the best of her ability, she can absolutely get on the podium here. That's a given. But after what we've seen, not only at nationals, but in the past few competitions and just this season overall, I would expect her not to get higher than fifth. And that feels optimistic. I think that the women in Japan and Korea are just too strong right now. 
And then considering Luna and Nina Pizzarone, there is just too much competition in that field. And Isabeau has looked very, very vulnerable at the end of this season so far. She could come back and surprise us. She is a hell of a competitor. But like you said, I expect a fifth place finish to be probably as high as I could hope for from her, which is still a very reasonable one, but not what she'd be looking for. Denise's last question here is just, is it possible for Nathan Chen to come back and compete with and or beat Ilya? Anything is possible. (laughs) (laughs) I love Nathan Chen. I'm a Chen enthusiast. He's one of my faves. And I think if he came back at full Nathan Chen power and brought what we saw in 2022 against Ilya, I think he could beat him. Ilya has also improved greatly since they last met, so it'd be a real interesting showdown. But do I think he's going to? No, I really don't. He's talked about the fact that he'd have to get hip surgery likely this summer if he wanted any chance at being able to compete in Milano Cortina. So it's obviously crossed his mind. He's done the math. I would love to see him, but at the same time, he has absolutely nothing to prove. The man is an Olympic gold medalist. I don't expect him to come back. I don't see it happening either. I do think it would be a heck of an uphill battle. The question is, is does Nathan want it bad enough? And I don't think so. I think he's moved on to other things. Could he beat Ilya coming back? I mean, he has the biggest scores of all time in his competitive career. There's no question that he is numerically the top guy from the sport in that way. But it's a different landscape now. And yeah, I don't know. Like you said, anything could happen, but it's not one I'd put my money on, really. Rachel from YouTube asked, do you think Kevin Amos will return to skating next season or will he retire before the 2026 Olympics? I think he's going to come back. If you had asked me the same question two months ago, I would have given the opposite answer. Now, I think him taking the complete step away for the rest of the season so that he can recover in every way, that gives me hope. Will he make it all the way to Milano Cortina? We'll see. But do I think he is going to come back and make the attempt towards that? Yes. I think that what we've seen from Kevin is, at least in his social posts, he looks like he's in a much more positive headspace, a much more healthier place right now. What I just want from Kevin is for him to do whatever is both artistically satisfying and mentally healthy for him. I don't want to see him grind himself into a difficult place if competitive skating isn't working for him anymore. But yeah, I think he'll be coming back. But I think that what we see from him early next season is going to set the stage for what the rest of his career looks like in this type of skating. Asterisk. Asterisk. We'll come back to that. And also, Rachel asked, do you think Chalk and Bates and Jason Brown will go to the 2026 Olympics? Chalk and Bates, yes. Jason Brown, no. I could be wrong. We'll see what happens. But Chalk and Bates, I feel like, have made their point that unless physically they have a reason that they can't go, I have gotten the impression that that is absolutely in the cards for them. And if they want to, the U.S. is sending them. Jason, I think the answer is, is no for now. But I think that that is highly dependent on how we see people like Max Namov and Andrew Torgashev proceed through the next couple of seasons. If they can come in and start showing the USFSA that they can score into top 10 at the Olympics or at Worlds, then I think Jason will not go. But I don't think that's just their decision. I think it's going to be also if Jason's body can hold up for the next two seasons. But my guess is no. I think we're just now starting to see Jason struggle a little bit in ways that we haven't before. And I think most of that has to do with the conditioning, the change that comes from splitting his time between pro and competitive skating. If Jason wants to go, I think Jason could go. But I do think Chalk and Bates are aiming for it for sure. Catherine via YouTube said, Shoma seems ready to move away from the jumping competitions to focus on skating that highlights his unique and elegant skating skills. Do you think that solo ice dance just recently recognized as an official uh, division in the ISU rulebook could be an option for Shoma and others like Kevin Amos, Denise Vasilius, Jason Brown, maybe even Kazuki Tomono, or perhaps even a return from Daisuke Takahashi. Yes, please. To all of that, I wish. I think it is actually very viable. We'll see how solo ice dance progresses through the next few years to see kind of who makes that jump over. But I think it's absolutely possible. We've talked about it, I think, on here a couple of times. Our expectation that in order for solo ice dance to really make a play and get more attention 
and get more visibility. I think it's got to have some pull from bigger skaters that are in traditional figure skating to help boost the interest in it. I would love particularly to see Kevin Amos and Denise Facilios make that step. I think it's a natural progression for them. And if Shoma wants to go hang out over there, I'm all for it. It's going to need some big names to come over. And I agree with everybody mentioned there. I think they could all be incredible. I don't see Daisuke Takahashi returning to any type of competition because I think physically he just has too many troubles now to do that type of ongoing elite competition. But I think if you saw some other returning skaters like, say, a Karen Chen who just did a competition in solo ice dance on the collegiate level or skaters like a Satoko Miyahara who is still absolutely brilliant and just gorgeous to watch, like if she would go into solo ice dance, you'd have my absolute attention. So I hope it becomes viable because I think that would be a really great place for a lot of these skaters who want to focus on artistry. And, you know, you mentioned Denise Vasiliev's there. The dude doesn't have the consistency in the jumps in his programs, but when you watch his galas, they're incredible. So yeah, hopefully that becomes a whole thing here very soon. Emily asked, at this time, what are your 2026 Olympic podium predictions across all disciplines and specifically the team event? Okay, so when we first saw this question, I was like, there's no way I can answer this. It's too soon. It feels weird. And then I just decided, screw it. I'm going to go for it and speak my truth. So men, Yumakagiyama, gold. Ilya Melanin, silver. Junwon Cha, bronze. Women, it is way, 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 way too soon to tell. But I went way out on a limb and went gold, Monachiba, silver, Ava Marie Ziegler, and bronze, Chaelin Kim. Wow. <laughs> just threw names in the air and just let them fall. That's where they are. Pairs. I went gold to Mitalkina and Barulova. The Georgian team? Yes. Okay. Uh, Luca Barulova from Georgia. Uh, silver, I went Rika Mura and Ryuchi Kiara. And bronze, I had Deanna and Max. So we'll see. And for dance, I went gold is going to go to Papadakis and Cicerone, who have not officially said they're coming back, but I think they are. Uh, silver to Chalk and Bates. And bronze to Guinard and Fabri. Team, I think we're going to see Team Japan get that gold. I'm going to say. Team Italy, silver medal, and Team USA, the bronze. Wow. Okay. So for mine, I'll just start with team. I went Japan, USA, Italy. So very similar to yours, but a switch there. I think Italy Italy is making a push, man. They're coming for it. Yeah, they're coming on strong, and I think they are focused on team. I think that you can see that coming. For the men's event, I went with Ilya as gold, and it makes everybody mad. Yuma in silver, and Adam Schallenthal in bronze. But again, this is two years from now, and a lot of things can change in that time period. For women's, I went with Hana Yoshida in gold, and everyone is shocked. Kaori is in silver, and everyone is sad. And then the third place is a toss-up between Cheon Kim and Monochiba. Interesting. Yeah. In pairs, for gold, I picked Kitty Paws. <laughs> I think that Bakari and Guarisi have improved so much over the course of the season. We're so impressive at Europeans. And I think the momentum that they're getting as a team, I think they're coming for the gold. Whoa. Unless something really wild happens. And I did forget about the Georgian team. I always forget about the Georgian (laughs) team. I don't know why. I can never remember that team even exists. So they were not in my considerations here. But yeah, I'm going with Kitty Paws and gold. I put in second, Deanna and Max. And third, uh, Riku and Ryuchi. However... Riku and Ryuchi staying healthy is a big question yeah. in this. And in that third spot could easily, in my prediction here, could either be the Georgian team or it could be the other Italian team and not the ones that won a bronze last year at Worlds. But instead, it is the other team whose name eludes me in the moment, but they are wonderful. <laughs> and uh, the yeah. team that I can't remember the names of. Yeah. Gonna take oh, my the... gosh. No, I love that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. And, you know, I've got notes in front of me and I just forgot the no, name there. Perfect. But anyway. And then for Ice Dance, I went Chalk and Bates, Piper and Paul, Renard Fabry, unless Gabby and Guillaume return, and then who the hell even knows? Everything is thrown into chaos. I think I've been open about the fact that if I do have a hot take, it's that I do not want Gabby and Guillaume to come back. I know. I am not interested in seeing them return to elite competition. I'm just not a big fan of comebacks like that in general. It's just not my thing. But yeah, if they do return, then Ice Dance will fall all over themselves to give them every win they possibly can. 
And I'm a little salty about that, if we're being honest. But yeah, that's my expectations here. See, you have way more hot takes than you thought. Now my silly hot take feels really ridiculous. <laughs> <laughs> Via YouTube, Jess is a mess, great name, asks, do you guys have any notable favorite or least favorite skating costumes? Every men's skating costume pre-1990-ish is my least favorite. All of those hideous onesies that they oh. always wore that like zipped up too tight around the neck, hated them all, every single one of them, done. Yeah. <laughs> I get a few from this season that I really disliked. And in a few places, I forgot to write down the names of the skaters because I don't remember them. I apologize here. You'll know who I'm talking about. There's the Estonian guy. He seems so sweet and so enthusiastic, but he's got that tiger striped costume <laughs> while he skates to the Lion King. And man, I'm not on board for that. He seems like a good dude. Let's put him in a better outfit. There's also one of the French skater guys that has a costume that looks like a sweatsuit that was bought at Walmart and then they cut holes in it. It's supposed to convey some sort of dystopian kind of thing, I guess. I don't know. And if it is a budgetary concern and that's why they have that costume, I apologize because I do understand that sometimes people are limited by their resources and what they can do, but it's still a really hideous costume. And the first costume that Rinka Watanabe had for her free skate this season that was just eating her alive at the neck, Rinka is a lovely skater, and that outfit was atrocious. And she got rid of it, and thank goodness, so I was glad to see that happen. When it comes to favorites, you honestly don't really focus on all of that too much, but I think that of the season, my favorite has been Monachiba's short program outfit. I do think that one is really cool. And if there's an outfit that I think is just absolutely outstanding and we've seen it live so we know how incredible it is, it is Madison Chalk's outfit from the Let's Dance short program from last year. Yep, you totally stole my answer. Madison Chalk's Let's Dance dress is probably my single favorite costume I've seen in years just because of seeing it in person and seeing how light hits it. It might not be the most avant-garde or high fashion, but it is remarkable live. It's just gorgeous. I will say just most of what Madison Chalk wears, I'd put on this list of favorites. Yeah, if there eventually is some sort of hall of fame for skating that has a whole wing of costumes, I feel like you could just put a Madison Chalk wing and you would have it taken care of. For the record, I believe the skater you were speaking of that had the tiger shirt and Skating to the Lion King was Vladimir Litvinstev. I don't know. We don't need to call Vladimir him. Vladimir Litvinstev. And oh. he is actually Azerbaijani, not from Estonia. <laughs> oh, shit. <laughs> uh, okay, sorry about that. Um, and again, seems like a really good dude. And I didn't want to call him out really that directly. But the fact that I got his country wrong is super embarrassing. So sorry about that to everybody involved. But man, that outfit I do not like. Moving on, <laughs> Rorolette asked, thoughts on over the boots tights? Hate them. Despise them. Rorolette had made a point of saying that I think they're supposed to invoke clean lines. It just invokes chunky angle to me, and I'm 100% on board with that. That is in the Adrian-specific scoring system that we talked about last time is an automatic negative one. Are we going to talk about the Adrian scoring system? Not now. Okay. Uh, although did somebody did, somebody did, ask. somebody did ask us if we would start including that with every episode. I think it's probably something more we might drop on social media rather than having it a part of We're the... We're talking about it. So I don't want to discourage because I agree. I think it could be fun to start sharing this uh, scoring system you have with listeners. But yeah, we'll talk about that more later. Yeah, <laughs> but certainly tights over boots is an immediate negative one. Uh, we do not like them in this house and we will always jeer at them every time we see them. So now we have what I think of as the chaos questions in this. <laughs> uh so uh, Emily Rose asked, and this is actually a great setup. I like this one a lot. So this is like assuming you have a bunker for like the end times. Let's get real dystopian here. So you have uh, your bunker and you have to do an inventory of it and its supplies. And you realize that there are no figure skating programs, but you oh, only no. have space for 20. I love that this idea is almost like every figure skating program is on like a laser disc that takes up a slot, like not just a bunch of them that would fit on a hard drive. So you only have space for 20 and you each get to choose 10 what are on your list. And I'll also tag here that Anne Sophie gave us a similar question that I'm kind of of rolling into this as well they just didn't paint as elaborate a picture as emily did 
So I don't want to oversell why we make all these choices because we are deep into the episode here. But yeah, we each get 10. So what are your 10 for the bunker? I also have to say thank you for putting us in the bunker together, Sophie, (laughs) Um, so that not only we have each other, but also we can watch each other's stuff. So that's helpful. Yeah, that bit is helpful. There was there were some trades made. We, to make we this did happen. make some trades. Okay, so uh, in no particular order, Gabby and Guillaume's made to love program that I mentioned earlier, 1993 World Championships, Kurt Browning, Casablanca. It's a classic. Paul Wiley's Carmina Burana, Jason Brown, Sinner Man. It's just perfect. Nathan Chen winning his Olympic gold medal with Rocket Man. Mishka Tonik and Dmitriev's Rachmaninoff Piano Concerto Number no. Two program. From 1994. Yes, I'm old. Elegy for Harp and Strings by Brian Boitano. Find it on YouTube. It's beautiful. The Find Me Gabby and Guillaume program. Yes, they got two on my list. So you're welcome. From On Ice Perspectives, it's something that I watched a lot during the pandemic. It just moved me and gives me big feelings. And I absolutely love the way it was shot by On Ice Perspectives. It's just beautiful. I had to put one showman in here and it was really hard to pick. So I went with his current short program, which is a medley of I Love You and Claire de Lune um, is from the Everywhere All at Once soundtrack. I'm just obsessed with that program. So it's going in the vault. And lastly, for very sentimental reasons, I picked One More for the Road, which is a classic Scott Hamilton program that he did for many years. And it makes me think of my mom, who's no longer with us because it was her favorite. I made the choice with mine to not pick anything from the current season, and that choice bit me in the ass at the end. (laughs) So my 10 for the bunker are Mariah Bell's Hallelujah Free Skate from the U.S. Nationals 2020. And I also say I went with all vibes here, just the, the skates that I watch to make me feel things and to lift me up. And this is one of the ones I go back to often. Tessa and Scott Moulin Rouge from the Olympics 2018, for obvious reasons. Keegan Messing's Home from Four Continents 2023. I love that program. Shoma Uno's Gravity short program, uh, specifically from the World Championships in Saitama 2023. Mai Mihara's Merry Christmas Mr. Lawrence short program. I could have gone with a bunch of them, but I'm going to land on 2022's Grand Prix final for that one. Kari Sakamoto's Elastic Heart from Skate America 2022. Chalk and Bates, Daft Punk, Alien, and the Astronaut program. And this one, it's specifically the 2022 Olympics team competition in Beijing. Yelim Kim's A Thousand Years exhibition program that she performed at an evening with champions in 2023. Maybe my most rewatched program. Uh, I go back to that one a lot. Young Yu's When We Were Young on Ice Perspectives video. And that's basically a practice one. She's not even in costume. It's just in just warm up clothes. But I go to that one a lot. And then Rika Mura and Ryuichi Kihara's Atlas 2 free skate from the Grand Prix final 2022. And then an honorable mention here. Just because, so he's sneaking 21 in. He put one in his luggage. Well, <laughs> what I'm going to say is that those are my 10 But I had a really hard time not putting Reed and Amber Livicus's Enough of Our Machines from European Champions 2024 in Lithuania in there. More than likely in the next year, that would have gone into the bunker supplies because I love that program so much. But yes, that's my list. I love that question so much. And we have a lot of watching to do (laughs) in the bunker. Yeah. (laughs) Also got one from Roulette that asked if skaters swapped programs with each other. What would you want to see? That includes costumes and choreography can be genuinely workable or maximum chaos combos. I went max chaos. So I put Gabby and Guillaume into the Rocky program from Lila and Lewis, full costumes, (laughs) just because I'd be really curious to see how humanity would respond to them doing the same choreography. It's mostly just a social experiment. I love that. All I wrote down for it was, I'd like to see literally anybody else try Chalk and Bates programs. You really, really love Chalk and Bates. I do, but also I would really like to see any other team go in and try to do specifically the things that they do in the way that they do. Because uh, I just know there's a lot of people that, whatever, aesthetically don't like Chalk and Bates as much. And I'd be interested to see how they react to other people trying to do all of the things that they do. So, yeah, that was mine. So I feel like both of our answers are like, me. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe a little bit. 
they also asked if single skaters formed it. I love this question, by the way, if single skaters formed into pairs and ice dance teams, disregarding nationality, who would you want to see together? Man, I tried. I have played lots of put these two humans together and think about it. And my brain just couldn't do it. I could only come up with one that made a little bit of sense to me. And it was Audrey Shin and Sota Yamamoto. So I put them together as a pairs team. I don't oh, know why. I like that. Oh, I like that so much. <laughs> yeah. So that's it. That's my only answer because I could literally not think of another. Mm, I've got four. I've got two pairs, two dance. In pairs, I would combine Ekaterina Kurakova and Bo Yang Jin. I love that so much. <laughs> I think with her big personality and his incredible skating and their size differential, and I've seen them on ice before at galas and they're kind of adorable together because he's a giant over her and it's cute. I just think they'd be super fun. The other pair I'd like to see, Sasha Trusova and Nathan Chen. <laughs> that is chaos. A pairs team chaos. with maximum quad superpower. And I know that Trusova was a huge Nathan Chen fan. I don't know. I just think that that would be incredible. In dance, I went with Satoko Miyahara and Dennis Vasilyev. I'll buy tickets right now. Right. Any competition, I'm there to see it. They would be gorgeous on ice together. We know that they're friends in real life. Maybe they're more than friends. I don't know. We don't do that on this show. But I've even seen them do little bits of stuff together in galas. And I'm like, I'm here for it. I would, I would go to that in a heartbeat. And then my chaos one in dance would be a dance team that is Han Lee and Roman Sadowski. No notes. I think that'd be all right. I kind of <laughs> like that. Sure. Those were fun questions. Uh, I was super into that. And then our final question, and dun, it was dun, a dun. last one here from Emily Rose. You were talking about earlier, do I have any hot takes? You uh, had a lot of hot takes. I, I did not know I was going to, but I had some. Emily Rose asks, what are your unpopular figure skating opinions? The only thing that came to mind, and it was the first thing that came to mind, is I've never liked and still do not like Elvis Stoiko. I don't know if that's a hot take. I don't know that anybody cares about Elvis Stoiko anymore or if they're his biggest fans. I genuinely have no idea. And it's nothing personal. I know nothing about him. But his skating, to me, was always like nails across a chalkboard. I just could never get into him. So I'm sorry, Elvis Stoiko. I know you are a legend. You are a much, much more famous and, and important and fancy person than me. <laughs> I, I've just never been a fan. I'm sure you're great. You're welcome at dinner anytime. I got a few here. One is that the jumps and the technical are just as important as the artistry. This is a sport and it has to be more than just pretty. I don't know if that's an unpopular opinion, but it is among some people. I can see that there is a wave of fandom that are much more obsessed with the aesthetics of figure skating than they are the actual technical side of it. And that they think that it's gotten more jumpy over the last 10 or 15 years. And it has definitely. But I think that they are equally weighted in this sport. It is a sport. It is an athletic competition event. And it, it needs to have things that are quantifiable and things that can grow and improve and advance the sport. And the jumps are the place where a lot of that happens. So I'm a hard liner on that. It is about complete skating, not uh, one edge to the other. But when solo ice dance becomes a thing for real, then you can have that. Um, and I'm all for that as well. My second one is that Sasha Cohen was terrible. <laughs> Uh, I know mean, this is like, this is just a random throwback, but when I first got into skating, the then queen of American skating seemed to be pushed really hard as being Sasha Cohen. She's probably fine. I just did not like her skating at all. There are other skaters. I've talked plenty on the show about the fact that I don't like Brady Tunnell and, and as much as I appreciate Gracie Gold's book and her story and everything she went through, I was not a fan of her as a skater in her primary era. But the one that I was always just irritated with when they were on ice was <laughs> Sasha Cohen. On the flip side, I really like Anya Sherbakova skating. I know that there's a subsection of skating fandom that think that she had garbage edges or not deep enough knees or any number of other concerns. And certainly the program and stuff has a lot of its own issues. But I always liked her as a skater. I wasn't mad whenever she'd win medals. Stylistically, I liked what she brought to the table felt awful for her sitting in the kiss and cry by herself at the Olympics and just being left just sitting backstage while drama happened everywhere else. All of that was just such a mess, but I always really liked her skating. And then the last thing that I had is that I don't think that commentators 
should be or need to be glowing and positive all of the time. It is an athletic competition. It is elite athletic competition. And it is part of their job to go on and talk about why things aren't working, to give critical examination of what's happening in the sport. It is the same thing that happens in every other sport. But for some reason, people want this one sometimes to be like overly flowery and everything is wonder. And granted, we are a very positive show, but we are not on air commentators that are professionally doing that. We are making that choice that in general, because it's the way we talk about the sport in our own living room, that we love the sport, we love the competitors, and we want to lift them up while we can still be critical of the performances. As I mentioned, Gracie Gold again, and she said in her book, criticize the skate, not the skater. That I'm very on board with. Some of the stuff that she talked about that Tara and Johnny said about her in some of her troublesome eras is problematic as hell and should be pointed out and was justifiable for her to talk about it in that way. But on the same token, I think it is important for the commentators to look at where things are breaking in performances where athletes are having problems because it is athletic competition. The scoring is a critique in and of itself, and you need to be able to recognize, especially as the sport turns to an adult sport that is not necessarily full of 14 and 15 year old people who are still essentially children, you have to be able to speak about it in a critical fashion. I think this question really represents our personalities really well. (laughs) (laughs) I came in, I'm like, I just didn't really like all the story going. You're just like, let me talk into the microphone. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Finally, my time to shine (laughs) or gripe. Obviously, I had some feelings about some of those things for sure. So, you know, thanks for riling up that hornet's nest. (laughs) That brings us to the end of... uh, If you made it this far, bless you. Yeah, (laughs) yeah. wow. Anyway, to wrap all of this up, if you stuck around with us through this very self-indulgent episode, (laughs) I want to thank everybody again for sending us all these great questions, for being engaged with the show, encouraging us, and, uh, and just joining our little community in the comments here. All of that is absolutely wonderful. I encourage you guys to answer these questions yourselves in the comments. I want to hear what you guys think about this. What are your bunker picks? We would definitely like to hear it. So wrapping up in the way that we usually do, the reminder that all things scoreography are available on our website at scoreography.show. The primary hub for all of our communication and for the episodes is the YouTube channel. But you can find us on social media at Instagram, uh, which is at scoreography, threads at scoreography, Twitter at scoreography. Blue Sky, which is uh, scoreography.show. Do we need to have a TikTok? We don't have a TikTok. Should we have a TikTok? Do you guys use TikTok? Let us know. We've debated about it. We're a little scared, but maybe that's something we should hop into. We have some ideas for things we could do in those sort of short video spaces, including my wacky scoring system. So (laughs) it's a possibility. Anything is possible. (laughs) (laughs) But yeah, so the next thing we're going to be talking about is the Challenge Cup. So uh, look forward to that and stick with us. And for Scoreography, I'm Adrian Buskey. And I'm Wendy Buskey. And we'll talk to you next time. Bye.